Right now, please allow me to introduce to you Amanda Foki um, in both a formal and a more collegial way. On the formal side, Amanda Foki is head of special collections at Fondren Library here at Rice University. She is a certified archivist and digital archives specialist. She has been at Rice since 2002 and has been working in the role of head of special collections since 2019. She is active professionally in the Society of Southwest Archivists and Texas Archival Resources Online. Amanda was honored by the Society of Southwest Archivists in 2018 with the Distinguished Service Award and by Rice University with the Elizabeth Gillis Award for Exemplary Service in 2020. On the collegial side, uh, Amanda has worked very closely with me over the last three years on these archives of the impossible and what they have increasingly required of us. <laughs> this has included overseeing shipments of literally hundreds of boxes, some of which constituted what her staff affectionately calls paper bombs. Paper bombs indeed. I have seen the boxes and what they do to a room. <clears throat> I have also watched Amanda expertly host numerous film crews. At one point, she actually shut down the main archival space for three full days to host such an event. <clears throat> Most recently, she has worked with graphic designer Dean Mackey on some most extraordinary exhibitions and posters in Fondren Library, which if you haven't seen, please do. It's just a couple blocks away. <clears throat> Amanda embodies and exemplifies the university at its very best. When I came here in 2002, it turns out the same year she did, I was told in so many words that, quote, you can do anything you want here, unquote. I didn't believe them. No, that can't be right, I said to myself. But it turns out that it is largely true and that Amanda Foki has helped us all to believe this a little more. Please help me welcome Amanda Foki. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I am really excited to be here this morning with you to share some information about um, what we might call the new kid on the block, um, the archives of the impossible here at Rice. And um, I want to start with a very sincere thank you to all the donors who are here today. And it's really exciting to have you here and be able to talk with you personally about your collections that are here. Um, and. Jeff Kripal, you were mentioning about the exhibits and the Fondren Library. Really, that was the work of the, um, the grad students and Jeff's team. Um, we are delighted to host it at the library, but um, that was certainly not all my work, but it was a, an honor to help um, on the sidelines with that. Um, and mentioning the grad students, I just want to say that when we talk about these archives being accessible, it's really because of the grad students' work. Um, they collaborated very closely with us in the archives. And so I just want to mention them by name. Um, Chris Sen, I'm, I'm hoping they're here. And if they're here, maybe they would raise their hand. Um, and uh, Stanislav Panin, and Thomas Millery, and also Learned Foot and Timothy Grieve Carlson here in the front. Um, so given that these collections, the archival collections, I'm not talking about the, uh, the, the print um, works that are part of this, just the archival collections run over 264 boxes of materials in total across all of these collections. Um, plus what will be terabytes of born digital and digitized content. Um, so having the help of these grad students who are subject specialists to describe these collections and help arrange them in a way that makes sense for researchers has just been essential. Uh, we couldn't have been providing access to these collections without them. Um, and I myself aspire to become a subject specialist. I am not yet. I am sort of a beginner on this path, so I hope you'll forgive me for any choices I make in describing things and showing pictures of things. Um, also, I'm aware that there's a lot of power behind language and how we describe the collections. Um, 
we're kind of moving away from using the, the word paranormal. Um, and I hope to learn more this week from you all about ways that this community wants to see their materials described. So uh, very open to conversations of that kind. Um, so to get started, I just wanted you to know that we have um, information online about these collections and I made a handout that's at the front of um, the space here that has these links and they're also um, going on Twitter thanks to Tim. Anyway, the little handout looks like this, and so it has the links for what I'm showing you here, so you don't have to worry about scribbling down URLs. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, a research guide that has links to all of our archival collections at Rice, so you can see the descriptive guides of them. And um, on the left, column over there is links to the oral histories with some of the donors, so you can listen to those in full. And today I have some short clips for you to hear while we're together in this space that I hope you'll enjoy. And then we have another guide, the second link that's on that little handout. Um, this one was created by my colleague Anash Barberg, who is um, a collection development librarian and reference librarian at Rice, and she has worked very closely with the team and helping get this conference together. And um, she is a wonderful colleague. And so her research guide here features books and journals, news, uh, things that you can find in Fonder and Library, but also it links out to archival collections that you can find in other locations. And you'll be hearing more about that in the panel session at 10 today, which I'm really excited about. So just a word about some of those books and journals and newsletters and things that, um, that we have received that literally were hundreds of boxes of those. So some of them have been cataloged already at Fonder and Library and some of them are waiting in our processing queue. So we are working, working on that. Okay. So I'm going to go through the collections. You, ha you have your brochure probably and it lists the names of the collections on the back and I'm Roughly going to go in order of those collections as you see them on the back of your uh, program. And starting with Jacques Vallée, and um, his collection is called the Jacques Vallée UFO and Paranormal Phenomena Papers. And um, luckily, since Learned Foot did such a great job introducing Jacques Vallée yesterday, um, I won't go into great detail about the background of Jacques Vallée. Many of you know him. Um, you know he is a computer scientist. His career began as an astronomer, and he co-developed the first computerized map of Mars for NASA in 1963. And as you likely know, he's known more for his work as an author, ufologist, astronomer, conducting research in UFO topics. He has touched the research of many people, and we're very honored to have his collection here. And as Jeff mentioned yesterday, um, Jacques Vallée's papers were the first to come here and sort of be the cornerstone of the archives of the impossible. And they will also be the last to open for research. Um, they have an access restriction on them for 10 years from the date of donation. So the first two thirds of the collection which came in in 2018 will be open in 2028. And then the last third of them which came um, in 2021 will be open in 2031. Um, just due to sensitive materials in them. There are 38 boxes total in the Jacques Vallée collection. Um, you're just seeing a sneak peek of just a bird's eye view of one of his boxes of cases. Um, and these came in beautiful order. That's Jacques Vallée's handwriting there on his own folders and such. Um, the, there are background files that include um, social trends, um, cults, related phenomena, scientific topics related to ufology, all of this um, assembled by Valet in support of his research. They contain field notes and press documents. Um, it includes correspondence with letters exchanged with um, M.A. Michel, Dr. Hynek, Dr. Guerin, and many leading researchers and investigators starting in the late 1950s going through the mid-2010s. Um, 
So I, I have an audio clip. You know, there are horror stories in this field where things have been, that felt important at some time, had been donated to a university and then the physics department says, why are we wasting shelf space for this garbage? You know, let's throw it away. And uh, I could cite some universities where things that were donated by the founders of the university it ended up being thrown away because they had to do with stupid subjects like parapsychology. So, um, and there is one not far from, from here, south of where I am. Uh, and I think that's a scandal. And the fact that you are not subject to uh, sort of the, the abuse of, uh, or the vagaries of, you know, ideas and doctrines and theories uh, in this way is that you can, you can keep things over a long time. And, uh, and I, I know you intend to do that. So that's reassuring to me, because I've been, in, in a way, I'm the custodian. I mean, I'm, I'm giving it as a gift, but I'm really the custodian of thoughts and writings that have been entrusted to me by, you know, by people, by witnesses, by other, you know, uh, people corresponding with me and so on. So I have a duty to preserve it and to make it available through people who care. And that's the relationship that I feel with, with Rice and with Jeff. So I, I appreciate Valet's emphasis on the importance of having excellent source material reliably available to researchers. As an archivist, I certainly believe in the power of accessible information. Um, and I'm looking forward to our panel at 10, where we talk with more of our archival colleagues about what's available to researchers. All right, um, the Anne and Whitley Strieber collection. Um, this collection primarily relates to Strieber's 1987 account of his own traumatic experience called Communion, A True Story. And the archives contain letters written by people describing what they have experienced in, in response to the publication of Communion. Um, and many of them including original drawings, of which this is one. Um, this collection is open for research, but because it, it includes the names and locations of the authors, um, there are certain private, like, privacy restrictions about how they can be used. Um, but they are available for research. The collection itself overall is nine boxes of materials, and eight of those boxes relate to these letters. I would say that probably seven of them are, are the original letters, and then there's a box of um, selected transcriptions and some other materials. So um, it is a fascinating collection. Um, I know Whitley Strieber was here um, this week looking at his own collection and just marveling about how long it takes to, to really go through each, even just a folder of those letters because it's so dense and rich. Um, began to come in immediately after Communion was published in 1987. And there were many, many more letters than anyone ever dreamed. When we published the book, the general thinking was that 25 or 30 people in the world had had this bizarre experience and nobody really knew what it was. Um, some of them thought it was alien abduction, but I was, uh, as I still am indeed, keeping an open mind. And, but then the letters began to pour in and they represented the most extraordinary um, collection of unusual human experience that's ever been assembled anywhere in the end. After the first week or so, my wife, Anne, realized what was happening, fortunately, and we started collecting the letters. She hired a secretary and the two of them worked on the letters for years. And we got, oh, hundreds of thousands of letters. And I think we, she saved out about 30,000, 25 or 30,000 that were, had a rich, full 
account of some kind of an experience in them. She boiled that down to a group of 115 and published that as the communion letters. And we kept the others in a file in a storage space for years because there was no interest in them whatsoever. But we felt like they were a human testament of an unusual sort, to say the least. And so fortunately, Rice came along, the archive was created, and I immediately said to Jeff Kripal, you can have the letters. And there they are. Yes, there they are. So wonderful. Um, all right. And so now let's talk about the Edwin C. May Laboratories for Fundamental Research papers. Ed May started his career in the 1960s as a nuclear physicist. And in 1975, he was hired by Charles Onerton to collaborate on a parapsychological, parapsychological research being undertaken at the Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn. It was during the course of this research that he became fascinated with the subject. According to May, I started serious parapsychology research with a master, Onerton, and saw substantial evidence for the existence of ESP. I was hooked. He went on to work at uh, the Stanford Research Institute, SRI, as a senior research physicist and received secret security clearance. It was at this time that he began his work on the federally funded classified research into extrasensory perception being conducted there at SRI. The project would go by several code names over the years, including uh, Grill Flame and Stargate. His collection is 54 boxes of materials. His papers include memos, correspondence, videos of early experiments, and formal reports to US government agencies which document the tenuous laboratory research and military applications responsible for developing the practice of remote viewing that the International Remote Viewing Association promotes today. Um, what you're looking at here is just a peek inside box six, folder eight. Um, this is a progress report of techniques to enhance man-machine communication from 1973 to 74. you have done putting it together for scholars is much more important than the research itself in some sense that scholars 20 years from now or even after i'm gone who would sit there and say oh my god look what happened because what i think we're dealing with here and i didn't invent this idea chuck honorton did by saying look humans have been wondering about aspects of of everything for a long long time you know what's the meaning of life uh do we survive our bodily deaths uh, how can we communicate, interface with the environment, blah, 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 blah. And what he told me once, and I think he's right, that we can't maybe have answered those questions with ESP research, but we are building tools in the toolkit that someday in the future they will be able to answer that question. And we've actually made progress in that. Uh, it's a model that my colleagues and I put together called decision augmentation. And that says that at any time, particularly medical research, where you you have a placebo and the drug and you get a result. Well, maybe that's true, but maybe not. Maybe the fact that psychics can, uh, the, the people who are deciding who goes into which treatment group or control group, making that decision, um, biases their, by using their ESP, biases the result. In fact, I know one really, and, and if that's true, that'll be a massive change in the way we think about problems uh, in terms of, uh, any kind of uh, sociological research, medical research, psychology research, parapsychology research, all the stuff that uses uh, in, um, statistics to come to some result. It's going to question that. doesn't mean you should throw them out, but the bad news is you have to question it. The good news is there's a protocol on how to determine what's going on. Is it actually the result of what you think, or is it just somebody being psychic? So Ed May's collection certainly lays out the patterns and examples of his experiments over time um, with remote viewing, and they'll certainly be of interest to those wanting to carry on his work in the future. It's an incredibly rich um, collection. 
We have the Brenda Densler UFOlogy Collection. And Brenda Densler is the author of a book entitled Lure of the Edge, Scientific Passions, Religious Beliefs, and the Pursuit of UFOs. And it was published in 2001 by the University of California Press. And her collection includes news clippings, reports, symposia, pop culture ephemera, book catalogs, correspondence. Really, it's about documenting public interest in ufology in the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, it is 10 boxes in size, and it includes um, a lot of print materials, um, realia, as we call it, and um, also some video content. Um, what you're looking at here in this little bird's eye view of her box is, uh, this is box three with folder 32 open, and this is, um, the folder is called, it's MUFON North Carolina Field Notes from the 1990s. Uh, MUFON, of course, the Mutual UFO Network. And then this is a, a bird's eye view of her box four, which is one of her aliens in the UFOs and aliens in the news folders. There's a chronological run of news clippings. Again, this is kind of her representation of public interest in UFOs over the years. So it's just a little boiled down snapshot like that um, through time. And I want to mention um, also that this was donated by Diana Pasulka. So. Thank you. And this is a picture of one of the video boxes from her collection. And so when you look at it, you can see that some of these are commercially produced recordings, and some of these are home recordings. And um, none of this has been digitized yet by our team, but we do plan to do some digitization from this material. So some of the home recordings would be things like um, local news stories about um, UFO sightings and such. Why do I feel so, so like these people? And yet, I'm not like, I'm clearly not like them. I've never seen a UFO. I've never been abducted. I can't find the least questionable event in my life that might be like a hint or a clue that there's been an abduction experience, just, just nothing. Um, the advantage to having those feelings is that it really did enable me to do what an anthropologist should do, which is approach the subject matter on its own merits, on its own terms, and, and you know, believe that uh, at least provisionally for a while. Believe that. Take that for what it's, you know, the, the reality of it. All right. The Larry W. Bryant UFO Research Collection, which is 96 boxes in size, just on the, um, just on the archival side. There were many, many uh, books and journals also donated as part of this gift. Um, Larry Bryant was born in 1938 and um, unfortunately passed away in October of 2020. And he had a number of uh, writing and editing roles with the Department of the Army in the 1950s through his retirement in 1994. Um, and during the 1970s, he served as a publication clerk for the Adjutant General's Office in the U.S. Continental Army Command. Um, in the 1980s, until his retirement, he served as a civil service staff writer, editor uh, for the U.S. Army News Service at the Pentagon. And although he never had any kind of UFO encounter himself, um, since 1957, he was heavily involved in the field of UFOlogy and the movement for government disclosure of documents related to the phenomenon. After a number of professional reprisals, Due to his UFO activism, he retired from federal service in June of 1994. In many ways, his life's work culminated in his book, UFO Politics at the White House, Citizens Rally Around Jimmy Carter's Promise. And that was published in 2015. The majority of this collection centers on the documents and correspondence related to the multiple Freedom of Information Act requests he filed 
seeking disclosure of information related to UFO phenomenon, and the many UFO-centric organizations that Bryant served as a member and in various leadership roles through the decades. It also includes documents and correspondence related to the numerous court cases he filed in attempts to force federal declassification of UFO documents through court order. And what we're looking at here is um, just a sneak peek into box 12. This collection is not, it's not organized. Um, it's been rough sorted into categories and the guide to the collection indicates that, but it's really such a large collection um, of materials and we just haven't quite gotten to this one yet. It, this is one um, that's gonna take us some time to organize. And this is another view, this is in box, tw the current box 20. Um, I would say there's, there were an easily another 100 boxes of books and newsletters and journals um, donated with this collection. Um, this view just happens to be a news clipping, but as I said before, there are a lot of court cases and FOIA request documentation in this collection. Um, we do allow researchers to request a small number of boxes to just get a feel for the content in this collection, but since it's not processed, um, you know, researchers wouldn't have a way to make a reliable citation from anything that they see and all of that. So it's not really very, very useful until we can get it processed. Um, and we were sorry not to have been able to capture an oral history with, um, with him before he died. Um, but his daughter Gretchen worked very closely with him toward the end of his life to ensure his archive would get into public hands, and so we're really grateful that that happened. All right, uh, the Stanley Krippner Parapsychology Publications Archive includes 20 boxes dating from the 1960s up until now. Just a few weeks ago, um, I received some 2021 publications from Dr. Krippner and filed them in the very last place in the last box. Um, and I'm sure there will be more. We look forward to that. He's a prolific writer. Um, he's a professor of psychology and founding faculty member at Saybrook University in California with a career there for nearly 50 years. Um, formerly, he was the director of the Maimonides Medical Center Dream Research Laboratory in Brooklyn. And he is a pioneer in the study of consciousness having conducted research for over 50 years in the areas of dreams, hypnosis, shamanism, and dissociation, often from a cross-cultural perspective and with an emphasis on anomalous phenomena. Um, this view is from box 20 of his collection. Um, this is a shamanism and dreams uh, from a uh, it's a portion of a book called Dreams, Understanding Biology, Psychology, and Culture. Um, and so uh, these are arranged in order by, by d date of publication. They came to us in order by date of publication with a full bibliography. Um, it's really wonderful, so it's already accessible because it's, it's, um, it is in great order. We do need to um, go through and refolder in our classic archival acid-free folders, so we'll be doing that, um, but this is open for research. Many of the folders in the first half of this collection, especially the, the earliest publications, contain historically valuable documents that are related to that specific publication. For example, there are letters written between um, Krippner and the book editor or between authors of book chapters, um, there are also examples of hand-typed manuscripts and drafts of book chapters, research papers, and journal articles, as well as some research data and statistical evaluations. Um, and what we're looking at here is in box 19 from 2013, Encounter with a Wizard um, from World Futures. And this is an image of Journal of Shamanic Practice, just another view, and we have an, a clip. Joined the Association of Humanistic Psychology, met all the leaders in the field at that time, and then found out that all of my other interests could very easily be subsumed from a humanistic psychology point of view. 
Also, I was very much attracted to the existential psychology wing of humanistic psychology because I'd studied existentialism at Northwestern University. And then years later, when Maslow became the pioneer of transpersonal psychology, I followed that particular uh, movement through, just wrote an article for the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology, by the way. And so what I do in psychology is mainly through the lens of humanistic, transpersonal, and existential psychology. And all three are foundational to our new book on suicide, by the way. We're bringing a, a lot of things from the existential and even the transpersonal perspective. And of course, I went on to become president of the Association of Humanistic Psychology and president of the American Psychological Association Division of Humanistic Psychology. And so I've been very, very active for that, from that point of view. And those are all reflected in the articles that I sent to Rice University, because you will see many of them are from humanistic, transpersonal, existential psychology journals. I have also main, more mainstream psychology journals. Of course, I should not say more mainstream because uh, the humanist psychologist is officially an APA journal. And it's been rewarding to me to see how the impact that humanist psychology has had upon uh, APA in general and upon the field of psychology in general. So, like a lot of the other collections that we have here, it's just this is a great example of the power of having the whole arc of a person's career available as an archive for research. It's really incredible to see the order of everything that he published from the beginning up until now. Okay, uh, the Richard F. Haynes UFOlogy Papers, um, also known as the Dick Haynes Papers. So he is an American psychologist who worked for NASA and various other research organizations from 1967 uh, to 88. And since the 80s, he's been actively involved in the study of UFO phenomena after retirement. Um, he's dedicated most of his time to this topic. So during the late 1980s, he also participated in the study of parapsychology in collaboration with Dr. Edwin May and the Stanford Research Institute. Um, however, Haynes' biggest passion was a study of UFO cases that involved pilots of civil and military aircrafts. And in 1999, a National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous, Anomalous Phenomena, NARCAP, was created to accumulate such reports. And Haynes assumed a uh, position of chief scientist for that organization. Um, the Dick Haynes papers contain a variety of formats. Um, what you see pictured here are examples of um, audio tapes or recordings of interviews with those commercial and military pilots who had sightings. Um, he also has interviews with people on the ground who have had unexplained sightings. Um, there are 17 boxes in um, the Dick Haynes papers, and two of them are just recordings, just two boxes full of audio recordings. Those tapes um, have been digitized, and so they're available to researchers on demand. Uh, we don't have the rights um, in terms of privacy and copyright to put those up online publicly, but they can be um, asked for. They're listed at the item level in the collection guide. Um, so next, we would like to make transcripts of all of those interviews to help make it more accessible. Um, you could imagine reading them one by one or doing some text mining across all of that transcription. Um, this is an example image of NARCAP correspondence. This is from box three. Um, there are also NARCAP technical reports, topical reports, investigator support papers. Um, there are also UFO case photos and drawings with locations and dates in the Dick Haynes papers. And then this is an example from box six with items relating to China. And this is a draft called Safer Future Flight. 
planning outline for a research competition among Chinese university students, 2013. So just to give you a sense of the variety of materials in his collection. And here's the basis of my opinion, and that is that I believe in God. And I believe that God created this planet we live on. And I believe that he's infinitely creative. And we, to me, I just look around my environment where I live here in Washington, and I see huge examples of this creativity. And so I say to myself, what if he created life elsewhere in the, in the universe, and they had space programs, like we do, but they're more advanced than they got here first? To me, that is logical. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't bother me at all. And I can still believe, uh, as a Christian, I can believe in the existence of God and Jesus. And it doesn't violate or obstruct my science view at all. Uh, it doesn't limit me at all. And in fact, it, it expands the options I leave open. So I wanted to include this particular clip um, from his oral history because it relates to the various ways we can study these um, these archival collections. He's talking about how his scientific work relates to his religious beliefs. Um, and the archives of the impossible here at Rice are, have an academic home base in the Department of Religion, um, you know, looking at how humans relate to the larger world, to the cosmos. Um, you could look at these collections from a variety of other, other disciplines, of course. I mean, I don't need to tell this audience that, you know, uh, certainly you could look at it with the, from the perspective of social sciences, psychology, physics, political science, all kinds of different ways. Um, Mainly, it's just important that the archives are safe in libraries and, and archives and can be approached by anyone in any discipline. Um, we have uh, the Stuart Alexander collection. And he is a physical medium based in the UK, not far from London. And in 2010, he published a book entitled An Extraordinary Journey, The Memoirs of a Physical Medium. He also has a website where he describes himself as exploring survival of the human soul beyond death and tangible communication between the two worlds. His collection includes eight boxes of news clippings and correspondence, and primarily what it is is audio. It's recordings of seances that he conducted. Um, some of them are presentations that he has given, and some of them are seances that he has attended that other people were leading. Um, so they're in audio cassette format, they're in reel-to-reel um, -reel format, CDs, DVDs, there are hundreds of them. Um, and we've not yet created an itemized list of these recordings, but we do plan to do that in, in this year, um, 2022. And from there, what we would do is send those recordings off for digitization, um, and then the guide would list them at the item level, exactly what's in the collection. And then ideally, we would also create transcripts for them, but again, because we don't have consent forms from those participating in the seances, we can't put them online publicly. Um, but they would be available for research and um, on demand. And Stuart Alexander also donated a significant library of published books and journals on the topic of mediumship, which we look forward to cataloging. And a special uh, thank you to Leslie Keen for her assistance in getting this collection to Rice University. Um, we have Karen Everett's source material for her documentary entitled American Visionary, the Story of Barbara Marks Hubbard. Karen Everett donated that source material. Um, Hubbard is known as the mother of conscious evolution. The documentary includes interviews with authors Marianne Williamson, Jack Canfield, Neil Donald Walsh, and many others. And in it, Hubbard asks, how can we drive through our global crises and blossom into a future that is equal to our human potential? So the source materials in this archive would be the full interviews with those scholars. You know, only snips would wind up in the documentary, but the source material is the full interviews um, and some B-roll, as they call it.
that's the one collection that's entirely born digital and only um, in digital format. Um, this is a sneak peek into Dr. Jeffrey Kripal's collection, which is also part of the archives of the impossible. Um, this is most of his collection is processed, and the guide shows what's in his collection. The, we received a few boxes recently, and those are not yet processed, so this is a sneak peek into an unprocessed box. That's why it looks like that. Our archives don't usually look like, like that when they're processed. <laughs> um, but his collection includes correspondence, unpublished manuscripts, course materials, ongoing research in his areas. Um, they include the study of comparative mystical literature, American countercultural translations of Asian religions, and the history of Western esotericism from Gnosticism to New Age religions. Um, there are 12 boxes of his materials so far, and we hope there will be more to come. Um, this image is from box 12 the, at the very end there that hasn't, as I said, hasn't been processed yet. And we don't have an oral history with Jeff, but we would love to include that in the archives of the impossible. We have too much oral history. <laughs> uh, no, never enough. Um, and this is in the coming soon category. We are very much hoping um, that we will be receiving some archival materials from uh, Paula Harris. And so we can stay tuned for that. This book is in the exhibit case in Fonder Library, if y'all have time to walk over there at some point today and see the exhibit material that's over there. Um, a couple of other notes. You may have noticed on the program that Charles R. Fuller and Robert C. Fuller are listed on there um, as having donated materials, and they certainly did. They donated um, a large run of the Fate magazine and also Eric Davis uh, for the Fortean Times. So we're really delighted to have those. I, in this presentation, I didn't focus on those because I was focusing more on the, um, the archival collections, um, but we are very happy to have those additions. Um, so just welcome. We are open for research here at Rice. The, um, we ask for research appointments just because a lot of our materials are stored off-site, and so we have to get specific boxes for researchers and bring them for the time and date when you're coming. So that just helps us be ready for you when you come. Um, as I said in the beginning, these collections comprise you know, about 256-ish oh, boxes of materials. So. Um, it's a lot of materials. We sometimes have people get in touch and say, I'm, I'm coming over to see all of the archives of the impossible. And it would be impossible um, to see them all at one time. And so <laughs> that's why we would invite you to make an appointment with us. And uh, we're happy to talk with you about what, you know, what we know about what's in the collections. And sometimes we might uh, refer you to one of our trusty uh, subject specialists who might know a little bit more even than we do. Um, so that's it from me, and I look forward to questions um, in the panel that's coming up at 10 with my fellow archivists. Thank you so much. <laughs>